I've been asked to talk about early tavern life, which is always a popular subject. Um, just about every town had at least one tavern. Most towns had at least a few. Um, it was up to the uh, uh, selectmen to recommend to the, the county commissioners back when Massachusetts had counties, um, actually county governments. Um, now they're just geographic expressions mostly. But anyway, um, counties, the county commissioners approved the taverns, but the selectmen uh, had to recommend them. They went by a lot of names. They went by the name of ordinaries, um, licensed houses, because that was the whole idea is that you couldn't just uh, serve liquor and entertain people uh, without a license. They didn't want to have what was called a disorderly house, which wasn't, didn't just mean you didn't have a license, but all sorts of nefarious things could go on there. And I'll keep it at that since we're a mixed company. Um, and they also went by the more uh, English name of inns. Um, and let's see what else. They also went by public houses, um, which is where we get the, uh, the abbreviation pub from, from public house. Um, and also they went by the more French name for house, hotels. Um, by the early 19th, 19th century, that was becoming increasingly popular to be more um, advanced and fancier to use the French. Um, like I said, it was the county commissioners who granted licenses, but the local selectmen had to not only recommend them, but vouch for the character of the would-be tavern keeper. So this is uh, one, one document from um, uh, Paxton, just down the road, um, where their selectmen there on the bottom recommended that somebody be granted a license. Um, Anyway, a lot of taverns were also called stage taverns. Um, they supported stage coaches. What stage coaches were, were basically a fast way to travel by staging fresh horses every 10 or 15 miles along the route. The idea was, you know, after walking all day, a horse would get tired, but if you only use the horse for an hour or two at a time, you'd get a lot more speed out of them. And so they would uh, stage relays of horses along the route to make for much faster travel. And that's why they're called stage coaches. Just like you know, when they fly into outer space, the rockets have stages to get them higher up. Um, so when one you know, set of fuel is exhausted, that falls away and um, you know, a fresh rocket fires. Then they're using horses, not rockets, but the same idea of staging along the way. Um, and usually the t uh, a lot of the taverns are on town centers, not all of them, but usually at least if not a town center around the town common, um, they, they uh, are at least in more established neighborhoods. And this is um, a drawing from a uh, man named John Warner Barber's uh, Geography of Massachusetts um, in 1840, and this is the town of Barry. You can see the, the big tavern sign, just like today. They like to have billboards by the highways to advertise services, so you can see it from a distance and know where you're going when you get there. Um, but basically, most taverns in most towns were, were private homes that had that public space and that license to entertain the public. But a family almost always lived there, and that was their home, and they lived in part of it and entertained uh, lodgers and locals in other sections of their home. But they're usually larger homes than most. Um, I've got a whole bunch of pictures I'll run through quickly. I'm not going to beat it to death. Um, but one of the features that they had, most all taverns had, was what they called a hall or a ballroom, a fairly large room without intermediate posts. So you could have meetings like we're having right now um, in, in somewhere in town that, uh, not but that wasn't the, uh, the local meeting house. Um, so they often had um, a, a ballroom or a, uh, a hall where they could um, rent, people could rent spaces. But they were often larger houses. Um, and oftentimes they went up for sale and you would advertise and talk about it. They usually called them tavern stand. Stand was pretty much any business. You'd have a blacksmith stand, a tavern stand. It was basically a, um, a public business. Um, but like I said, I'll just go through these these quickly. Some of them may be towns you're familiar with, even buildings you're familiar with. I'm not going to beat them to death. Um, but as you can see, they, in, in one of this is a, the view of one of those um, halls or rooms. This one in, um, in Connecticut actually has a uh, musician's platform, a musician's balcony, 
where one, two, three violinists, other musicians could play for dances and things like that, which is one of the more popular things people rented the, the hall and the tavern for. The, the piazza, as New Englanders called them, the big porch, to use a more Germanic term, um, was very popular on a lot of taverns, especially in the summertime, um, and, and some larger private homes, which taverns were. But the, the piazza, as New, England call, New Englanders like to call them, was another common but not universal feature of these taverns. This one is not in New England, this one's actually in Ohio, but it was built by New Englanders, so it kind of looks familiar to us. Um, and uh, down the road in Dudley, the Black Tavern, um, in the ordinary in Duxbury, and this one, the Williams Tavern. Um, again, the common features, a large home, often with a piazza, often with a large hall, and usually with a sign out front to advertise to the public. This, this one is dear to my heart. It's, it's a part of the property Old Sturbridge Village. It was Oliver White's house. He never ran it as a tavern, but he um, had to sell it because he went broke several times. And um, it, his uh, later, later owners ran it for many, many years as a tavern. And more taverns with more piazzas. A little closer to home, the old Paxton Inn. Um, you might be familiar with it down the road, Paxton Inn. So they had four taverns and one right over the line. Um, and there's the Paxton Hotel, circa 1910, 1940. And of course, the Paxton Inn survived until, what, about 20 years ago when it burned down and uh, continued in business for a couple hundred years, um, becoming a, a popular restaurant, even with its own postcard. Um, but here, in, well, not here in Lancaster, in your, your town of Lancaster, um, had a couple historic taverns at Five Union Turnpike. Um, Paul Willard built this um, one that became the Old Brick Tavern later on. Um, he had great expectations because the turnpike was being, the Union Turnpike was being built and he figured that's a great place to build a tavern. Unfortunately for him, um, the Bolton and Lancaster Turnpike through North Village proved more popular than the Union Turnpike. And so the Old Brick Tavern got sold and used for a lot of things. By 1870, uh, a Shaker community bought it. They didn't live there, they rented it out, and um, the people who leased it used it as a boarding house in World War I. It became an army barracks for officers, and then it became a private convalescent hospital. Um, but recently it was just sold, last month actually. Um, but it had quite the property, as you can see here, by the aero view. So, but it's sold, so you know, unless you make an offer to the new owner, you can't have it. <laughs> anyway, um, and there was another um, large hotel in Lancaster, again, with the, the multiple piazzas or porches on them, the uh, Lancaster Hotel on Main Street that was built in 1786 but burned at the beginning of the 20th century in 1906. The biggest hotel in the country in 1830 and the biggest hotel in Massachusetts for a long, long time was the Tremont House in Boston. And the Tremont House was not a private home that got turned into a, a, a tavern or was built as a private home and tavern like the, um, the one that uh, the, old, um, the old Brick Tavern in Lancaster. But it was built as a hotel in 1829 with 170 rooms um, that went for Two dollars a night. Now, to give you an idea what two dollars a night was in 1829, if you were a blacksmith, you probably made twice what an unskilled worker made, and you made about a dollar a day. So, you know, that's that's a pricey hotel room. But it included four meals, and um, and uh, it had a lot of famous guests who stayed there, including um, Davy Crockett and Charles Dickens. Um, but as you can see, it's four stories high. It was faced in granite. This uh, neoclassical building with a big Romanesque um, a turret on the roof, and uh, it was on the corner of Tremont and Beacon Streets. Um, it's not there anymore, it was torn down around 1895, but it had many firsts. The Tremont House in Boston was the first hotel with indoor plumbing and running water, not to every room. Um, they had a steam pump that pumped water to a tank on the roof, 
and the running water mostly went to the kitchen, the laundry, and the eight, eight count them, flush toilets that were on the first floor. So 170 rooms, eight flush toilets. Yes, sir? Is that where the Parker House is now? Um, <coughs> I don't know Boston geography. I, is it? I don't know. I mean, it was at the corner of Tremont and Beacon Streets. Is that where the Parker House is? I don't think it is. I don't think that's where the Parker House is, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Anybody who knows Boston better than I might be able to tell you. Sorry. I'm sorry? Across the street from the common, right? Again, I don't know Boston geography. I'm sorry. I'm from Connecticut. I know enough to, I know enough to take the T in and follow the Freedom Trail. You know, I'm sorry. I, I don't know every detail of Boston geography. But, yeah. If somebody wants to Google on their phone a map of Boston in the Parker House, um, the Omni Parker House. I have a friend who worked there. I always joked with mutual friends that she had, she had something in common with Zhou Enlai, the former premier of North Korea, North Vietnam, I should say. They both worked at the Parker House. He in 1912, she in <coughs> 1979, but nonetheless, they both worked there. Um, anyhow, um, but it not only had um, indoor toilets, eight of them, um, but it had uh, baths, um, that, not in every room again, but you could make arrangements to have a, um, a bath in a copper tub. You paid extra, that cold running water could be heated. Um, they used coal gas to heat it. It had a reception area. It was the first hotel that had locked guest rooms. And it was the first hotel that had free soap. I have no idea if the guests stole their free soap, like a lot of people do. But nonetheless, it was also the first hotel in this country that had bellboys. So it really stat, stat, um, set the standard for luxury until the Astor House was built in New York City in 1836, designed by the same architect, um, a man named Isaiah Rogers. Um, but there it is, in all its glory, with, with a lovely uh, militia uh, uh, regiment marching, or company marching by. Maybe go to meet Lafayette. Nope, and it wasn't built till four years, five years after Lafayette was there. So, there we are. Oh, I'm sorry, I got behind in my slides. Now, so, if the Tremont House was the the cream of the crop, you did have um, a wide variety of accommodations in between, and usually what was more at the bottom of the barrel was when you got out of the um, more populous areas and into the frontier, um, like this uh, period illustration shows in Arkansas with a little log cabin, and uh, they do have the advertisement for whiskey over the door, and the the tavern keeper there with his fiddle and his rather unkempt family um, hanging out and happy to entertain the growing, the, the tavern keeper with mom smoking her pipe there in the doorway. Um, as, as Heather mentioned, I work at Old Sturbridge Village and we have the um, home at, at Old Sturbridge Village of a, of a Sturbridge farmer named Pliny Freeman. His brother, Lyndon Freeman, um, realized that the thin, rocky soil of New England wasn't the best place for farming. And he lit out for Ohio and, um, in, in the 1820s, in 1825. And uh, when he was an older man in the 1870s, he wrote down a reminiscence of his life. And he re account, recounted um, his trip out to Ohio um, as a boy. And I'm not going to read you the whole blessed thing because we'd be here until tomorrow. But I'll ju just read you a quote. Quote, after a toilsome journey of 20 days by land, by canal, that's the Erie Canal, across New York State, which opened that year in 1825 that he wrote, and by Lake, um, Lake Erie, they would add both sailing ships and steamships on Lake Erie, we arrived at the city of Cleveland, and from thence by an ox team through mud and water to Greenbrier, that soon became Parma, Ohio, where we arrived late in the evening on Saturday night, much fatigued and dispirited. Our hostess, Mrs. Fay of the Log Inn, and he puts in in quotation marks, was quick to discern our need of cheering and with laudable success set herself to relieve our tired and despondent minds. And he goes on to recount how his mother was tired, then on the count of the children, one was missing, and they thought it had fallen in the mud and drowned, and then they found it underneath all the, all the family paraphernalia in the bottom of the ox cart. Anyways, and we were glad to accept the hospitality that Fay is in a log hut of only two rooms and a loft, and he puts loft in quotation marks, where we boys and girls enjoyed that sweet, restoring, balmy sleep. So you've got both extremes, the elegant Tremont house and the little log cabin. This one, more than that, our, um, Arkansas 
traveler uh, illustration probably is a little uh, more what Mrs. Faye kept there in Parma, Ohio. Um, it's, it's what I call a dressed up dog trot log cabin. Usually what a dog trot log cabin was, a fairly common architectural form on the frontier, was two log cabins uh, with a roof over both of them and an open area, the dog trot, in between them for um, ventilation and a little bit of shelter. Um, this one has gotten dressed up by the addition of glass windows and, and some clapboards on it, but it's still just a log home on the frontier. An architectural style that never really caught on in New England um, until the 20th century. I live in a log cabin, it was built in 1982, but it's not an architectural form that was common here. It was actually developed in Scandinavia and uh, catches on where you have um, Swedes and Germans settling, um, like the mid-Atlantic states. Another function that taverns often serve is post offices. Not to give you the whole history of the postal service, but basically um, people with connections to the political party in power in Washington um, would get appointed as a local postmaster. It's nobody's full-time job, but it was a way to make extra money. And almost always the people they appointed ran a public business because the government wasn't running around building um, local post offices. Even in big cities like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, the post office was in the home or place of business of the postmaster. Um, and that's true in these country towns as well. So that's why the postmasters almost always appointed are tavern keepers or storekeepers. Because they run a place that people are expected to be able to go seven days a week to collect their mail. You didn't have any uh, local delivery or um, home delivery of mail in the countryside. You had to go to the post office to collect your mail. And stagecoach lines would bid, often underbid, um, to try to get the right of of carrying the federal mail. Not only was it a lucrative contract to carry the federal mail, but it gave your stagecoach line the reputation of being faster because the government held um, the mail stage to a much tighter schedule than, um, than other stage companies held to. Um, stage drivers usually find half a day's pay for every hour they were late. So it really gave them an incentive to keep the stage moving. But that meant that you didn't have a very luxurious travel if you took the mail stage. You got there as fast as you could get there because, take, because of taking the mail stage, but um, they basically stopped long enough to change horses. So if you could answer the call of nature and maybe buy a drink or some food at a tavern while the horses were being swapped out, good for you. Otherwise, tough, we're going. The horses are hitched up. Get back in. Um, if you were not in as much of a hurry but wanted to be able to um, have a little more time um, to eat meals, to s have a bed to sleep in at night instead of bouncing through the dark on the stagecoach, um, you could take what was called the accommodation stage. They made accommodations for your comfort. They would stop at breakfast time and let you buy breakfast at whatever tavern they were switching horses at and wait until you know, the, the, the breakfast was over. Um, and same thing with, um, with dinner and supper in the evening, and then as it was getting dark, usually accommodation stages would usually stop for the night and let you uh, try to find a place at, at the tavern where they were stopped for the night, um, rather than just moving on, keeping good time, like the mail stage did. And of course, like, as I mentioned, the taverns did have to advertise. I showed you that picture of Barry um, with a big, big tavern sign out front on the common along the, along the road. Um, and like, uh, restaurants and hotels today, often the tavern signs were very high and often very noticeable, not just... By law, they're required, at least here in Massachusetts, if you own a, um, a license to keep a public house, um, what today we call a liquor license, you had to put at least the first initial and the last name of the proprietor um, to make sure it was all on the up and up. Now, you could call your, your tavern something else, like this stranger's resort here, trying to attract um, other people. Why their hats are flying off, I have no idea. A lot of wind, it, it was the artist's whim, um, or maybe it just fills the blank space on the board. I don't know, um, but still it's remarkable. Um, a lot of times that's the image that the tavern keeper is trying to convey, like tavern keepers, restaurants today, often have a symbol. You know, you don't need to, to know, if I took away the KFC, you'd know that, you know, with a, with a kernel there, that you're gonna get fried chicken. 
Um, you know, if you saw the big green H, you'd know it's a Holiday Inn, the big red six. You know what it is, the golden arches, heaven help us, or the, um, or the, or the purple bell, um, which also says you should buy some um, Tums. But anyway, and here's more, another picture of a, of a common, this is not John Warner Barber, um, but it's something in Connecticut, but again, the blue arrow pointing to the elevated um, sign of the, uh, of, of the local tavern. So people traveling through town knew where to go. Um, and Mr. Loomis here, his inn, you know, he's telling you what he'll serve. He's got the, the bottle and the glasses out there to let you know. Um, and, uh, and again, Mr. Um, uh, Aldern's been there with the, what I like to call the sign of the stunned ox. This, these, these two signs are in the Connecticut Historical Society. They just changed their name. Um, <coughs> no longer Connecticut Historical Society. It's Connecticut um, Museum of Culture and History, I think. Anyway, you gotta put his, yeah, history to that. It isn't Hartford, it's a wonderful institution, but they have one of the best collection of tavern signs. I'm sorry that the sunlight is hitting the screen so, so much, but um, they got one of the best collection of tavern signs in the country. And uh, the one on the left, with the, the rather, you, you can see it's a very stunned ox. The uh, a museum I worked at for, well, part time for 20 years, um, Old Bethpage Village Restoration on Long Island, adapted that sign for, for their, their tavern. And so I saw its reproduction a lot, and so it was familiar to me. But they have walls and walls in, at, uh, in Hartford there of, of the best tavern sign collection. Uh, in the country. So I just will run through a few that I hope you can see. Um, Birdsley, Inn. the man's name was Birdsley, but you know, he's got a big picture of a, of a chicken, a bird, to give that idea more memorable. The one on the right, um, you might see a checkerboard arch. There's a lot of Masonic symbols, the all-seeing eye of God, um, to not only uh, let you know that the tavern keeper's a Mason, but if you're a Mason, you might want to stay there because of the fraternal brotherhood of, um, of Freemasons. Um, the American Eagle was a very popular uh, decoration for a lot of uh, taverns at the time. Bright colors were often used by taverns. Um, you know, uh, the, the mounted men on horseback, the sun, uh, the, the one on the upper right is a beehive, um, which is popular. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that the screen is so washed out. Eagle Tavern was a, was a common name for a lot of these taverns. That was not the only one. And there were people that were getting into um, uh, abstaining from alcohol. 200 years ago, the average American drank uh, uh, over three times as much liquor per capita as we do today. And I doubt anybody would argue with me that America is a fairly dry country today. I know some people don't drink, some people do. But um, 200 years ago, the average American consumed over three times as much alcohol per capita um, so for adult men, averages over a quart of liquor a day. Um, so that's, that's a lot of, that's like rock star drinking. Um, and so there was a backlash to it, a temperance movement. And so um, if you were trying to abstain from alcohol, the last place you wanted to stay was a place that was, you know, known where everybody in town went to drink. So you started to have these, what are called temperance houses being formed to try to um, assure uh, teetotalers, non-drinkers that um, they would have a place that they wouldn't be tempted um, or offended by the inebriates. But um, usually it was hard to make money with a temperance hotel because as restaurant keepers will tell you today, one of the best ways to make money is to get the liquor license. Um, because there's a high markup. We'll talk about food at taverns. So that's another thing that they were required. A tavern, um, a tavern keeper to get his license had to agree to provide food and lodging for man and beast. So you had to have, you had to have um, refreshment and the money's in the liquor, um, but you had to have food and often drink because that's what people expected um, for, the, for the patrons and had to have uh, hay, fodder, um, and, and at least some shelter for their, their animals, their horses, their oxen, whatever they're moving through with. Um, so the, uh, the tavern food was basically a family dinner. Um, most of these country taverns, it wasn't a restaurant. There was not a menu. You didn't order off a menu. It was basically just, um, it was just the family dinner, whatever the family was gonna have for breakfast, gonna have for dinner, 
going to have for supper in the evening. Um, I should mention that in the uh, 17th, 18th, 19th century, um, the, the biggest meal of the day was in the early afternoon. That was dinner. Um, many of us today, when we have Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner, have it then. The rest of the year, you know, we don't do it um, because we're usually away at work and we substitute dinner for lunch. Um, lunch originally was just a bite, a swallow, was what a luncheon was. What we, today we call a snack or a coffee break um, that came in between breakfast and dinner. Breakfast was the second biggest meal of the day um, and they were often substantial. Um, one of the best sources I found for finding out what life was like in these taverns was Nathaniel Hawthorne, um, you know, the author of uh, The House of Seven Gables and The Scarlet Letter and uh, The Blythedale Romance and a bunch of other light classics. Um, he did research for his novels by, in the 1830s, traveling around New England, staying at a whole lot of different uh, taverns and keeping notes for himself about the places that he saw, the people that he saw, the people he met, and the, um, the tavern keepers he stayed with. And uh, luckily for us, these notebooks have survived and gave more than one um, English PhD student um, something to, uh, to transcribe, to analyze, to write about, and to publish. And so um, we can learn a lot about taverns by reading um, by uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, not in his novels so much, but in his own notebooks that he did for research. Um, but anyhow, um, he described both good and bad taverns, people, places, but he said the dining room was usually laid out with long tables, although some had small tables, they varied. Um, and usually the best chairs, painted chairs, in the house were in the dining room, um, as opposed to the bar room. Um, he said well, a staple for breakfast or supper. Supper was the evening meal. So basically, you starting your day, you had your breakfast about an hour after rising. Um, if you were hungry, you would have a lunch in mid-late morning. Um, then you had your dinner, uh, 12, 1, a little before 2 in the afternoon. Um, that was your big meal, your main meal of the day. And then in the evening, you'd have, um, the late afternoon, you'd have what was called tea. Um, which might or might not involve the beverage tea, but was um, usually a cold meal, except unless you had hot tea with it. Um, but it was usually leftover cold meat, bread, butter, um, uh, sometimes jam and things like that. And then if you were uh, very um, uh, fancy, you might in the evening have another meal called a supper that again tended to be less elaborate and more cold foods. Uh, that's why when I mentioned the Tremont House, include that $2 a day included four meals. Those are the four meals. Breakfast, <coughs> dinner, um, tea, and supper. Um, in your house, tea was the usual the meal. If you had anybody over, that's what you invited them over for. Because people often, women often visited each other in the afternoon and um, you know, would sew and talk. And you know, when you're going to have that cold meal in the af late afternoon anyway, you can invite the neighbor to stay and then send her home. Um, before it gets dark. But anyway, um, those are the four meals of the day. But one of the staples that Hawthorne and others travelers mentioned was bread and milk as a staple for breakfast or supper. Um, anybody ever have bread and milk? I bet you have. I saw one hand hesitantly go, I bet you have. Cold breakfast cereal. What is cold breakfast cereal? It's expensive bits of stale bread that you pour milk on. <laughs> That's what they're doing. They're taking stale bread, crumbling it up in a bowl, and putting milk on it. And you eat it with a spoon. It's what you know, Kellogg's and um, General Mills and other uh, clever industrialists um, figured out that they could sell it to us for a lot more money than just taking our stale bread and pouring milk on it. Um, but anyhow, uh, Hawthorne described, quote, a huge wash bowl of milk was in the center of the table and a bowl and spoon provided for each guest. Um, and uh, a lot of travelers say, you know, it's, that's what they'd have for, for supper and then they'd head off to bed. Um, the second biggest meal of the day was breakfast, um, which was usually involved fried foods. Today, you know, if, you, if you're not just rushing off to work with that cold bowl of cereal, um, usually breakfast foods, when you go out or you've got the day off, are fried. Why is breakfast usually fried foods? Because you can fry food at a much higher temperature than you can boil food. Water boils at 212, oil burns at like the high 300s, low 400s. So you can get the food hotter faster 
in oil than you can in water. So that's why breakfast foods are often fried. And usually then, 200 years ago, the leftover, fry, leftovers from the day before that you hadn't already used up got fried up and served for breakfast. That's why things like corned beef hash is a popular breakfast food today still. So they would fry mush, they'd fry ham, beef, pork, sausage, um, chop them up into hashes with potatoes or just have potatoes. There was always bread on the table, whether it was with, in a bowl with milk or not. Um, and usually New Englanders would expect butter, sometimes honey, um, preserves, pie, pickles, relishes, fish, chicken. Um, in fact, some, some taverns were known for having bird suppers, you know, especially when um, people would go pigeon hunting or duck hunting as the migratory birds was usually what people hunted. Um, and some would have steaks and stop chops and stews and boiled dinners, the classic, what they call the New England boiled dinner, which we all expect at St. Patrick's Day, corned beef and cabbage. It's not an Irish food at all. It's too, too fancy for Irish or that beef. It's a much more English food, but we tend to think of it now for St. Patrick's Day. But 200 years ago, it was called the New England boiled dinner. Vegetables were served in season, but vegetables were usually cooked to mush. They usually would cook vegetables to what they call the sarce. Or we spell it sauce. Um, basically, they'd cook them down. You wouldn't expect the, you know, nice, crispy, crunchy vegetables, but mush that you could um, shovel in. Um, and usually uh, on the table for breakfast would be tea or coffee or both. Um, at every meal, New Englanders usually expected hard cider. Um, our second president of the New England boy, John Adams, um, famously always had a um, gill of cider, hard cider, for breakfast every morning. Well, they weren't importing orange juice from you know Florida or Brazil, so you know that's what he had. It was a little bit tart, a little bit bracing. If you look it up online, they'll say he had a tankard of cider. That's marketing for the hard cider industry in 2023. He didn't have a tankard of cider. He had a gill, which is four ounces, which is you know your little. I've got one over here, a little, a little um, you know juice glass, right? There's your there's your orange juice glass, right? If you go to a restaurant, they give you like more, but that's usually what you get at a restaurant for your orange juice is a juice glass. That's four ounces, a gill, a half a cup. That's what um, Adams in his diary actually said he had for breakfast, every, with breakfast every day. And except for breakfast, and I guess if you ask, you could have it. Most meals there was also um, liquor served at the table. Um, and the tavern keepers, there is, there's a tavern meal with a nice long table everybody crowding around it at uh, dinner time. So when the family dinner is ready, you pay a, um, a fee and sit down and join the family for dinner. Um, and you could go on and on and on about uh, um, the food, but of course a lot of people, the locals especially, came to taverns to drink, and a lot of travelers did too. Um, that's what the license is all about. That's where the money is to be made. Um, and the drinking went on at a place called the bar room. It's not called a bar because they had a polished brass rail to put your boots on. It was called a bar because they kept the liquor behind bars. So the, so the patrons couldn't get to it um, when the tavern keeper had to step out to greet a new guest or for other purposes. Um, so the, the liquor was locked up behind bars when the tavern keeper wasn't there. That's why it's called a bar room. And old taverns had these little barred off areas uh, along one wall or especially in a corner um, for holding the liquor. It's also called a tap room because that's where you tap the barrels of, of, of liquor that you would serve to your patrons. Um, and distilled spirits was what men drank in bar rooms. Um, they, the most popular drink here in New England uh, was rum um, followed by gin. Gin is neutral grain spirits that are flavored traditionally with juniper berries, but frankly, in early America, they throw in anything that tasted kind of like a pine tree and uh, you know, <laughs> called it gin. And the third most common drink you find being served at these bars was brandy. It's not fine cognac most of the time. What it is, is um, distilled hard cider. It's cider brandy. They call it brandy, but it's basically distilled cider brandy. It's a local. Um, fermented the vast majority of apples that were grown and most farmers had an acre or two in apple trees um, so they grew a fair amount of apples back then but most of the apples were not consumed by eating them but by drinking them it was a much easier way to um, process the apples and to preserve the apples 
was to turn them into a hard cider, eh, four or five percent alcohol, which is enough to preserve to keep it in a tight bottle or tight barrel with the air out. And but that was a table beverage. When men went to taverns to drink, they ordered hard liquor. Um, it, they they could order other things, but usually um, hard cider was something you just expected on the table um, with your with your meal. It was just a given. Kind of like if you go to France or Italy today, you kind of expect to have you know, grape wine with your meal. In New England, you expected to have hard cider with your meal. But if you went, and some people had hard liquor with their meal, as some people do today. Um, but, um, but rum and then gin and then brandy were the big drinks of New England. Where did the rum come from? The, that, the rum came from two places. And um, you could get you could, the cheap stuff. <coughs> Rum, rum, if you don't know what rum is, rum is basically uh, dis fermented molasses that's then distilled to, to concentrate the alcohol. Alcohol boils at 177 degrees at sea level, water boils at 212. So if you take something that's a mixture of alcohol and water, like wine um, or fermented uh, molasses, um, you heat it up to over 177 degrees and, but not to its boiling, not to the water boils at 212, the, um, the alcohol vaporizes. And if you have that in a closed vessel and then cool that down through winding copper pipes, that's called distilling and hence that apparatus is called a still. What you do is you then have the pipe come out and what comes out the end of the pipe is, is alcohol. And what's left in the pot is flavored water. Um, so that's, that's distilling, that's how they make brandy, whiskey, any kind of liquor you want to talk about. Um, that's that principle of alcohol evaporating at a much lower temperature than water is how you do it. By the way, if you ever want to make um, uh, like mold wine or something at Christmas, don't put it in a pot on the stove for an hour and a half because all you're doing is evaporating the alcohol unless you want the alcohol to go away. Um, the heat, it, heat it quicker, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But um, but uh, a lot of people today, when you think of bar, I know, when I think of bar in the 21st, you think of all those taps and all the, the beer, and beer, beer, beer is, is a big, 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 big beverage in America today. Um, behind Czechoslovakia and China, we're a big, big nation of beer drinkers per capita in 2023. But in early America, especially early New England, beer was not at all common. Um, there were over a hundred distilleries, mostly making rum, some making um, grain, alcohol, in uh, Massachusetts in the early 1800s. There was one, count them one, um, beer brewery. It was called the Boston Beer Company, not to be confused with the one that makes Sam Adams. That didn't get incorporated until the 1980s, um, but it had the same name. The Boston Beer Company, 200 years ago, employed all of eight men. And mostly the beer was to be served in Boston taverns, but especially sold to ship's captains. Why to ship's captains? Because crew, because men on ships need to be drinking something that's mostly water. They'd like to be drinking mostly alcohol, but they, they and they want some alcohol. If the captain has barrels of really foul water and barrels of rum, the guy's going to drink a lot more rum and a lot less foul water. If he gives them beer on these short coastal runs, they're going to be more likely to drink it and they're less likely to get drunk in the process. So anyway, so beer was not something you got at most of these rural taverns. Yeah. Were the, was the molasses being brought in from the Caribbean? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I got away from the rum. I'm yeah. sorry. Oh. No, no, that's great. No, yeah. The molasses is being brought in from the Caribbean. Um, the, the Caribbean was, um, was uh, colonized by Europeans um, mostly to uh, make to grow sugar, to have sugar plantations, um, and and make a fortune. That's what made England the world power. Was originally its its Caribbean um, sugar plantations, and the um, the process of taking sugar cane, squeezing out the juice, and then cooking off the the water to get solid sugar um, is what they were trying to do. But there's some of the the. Uh, product of the sugar cane that's sweet that won't cook off, that won't solidify, that won't crystallize, and that's called molasses. Oh. Um, and and what you can do with molasses is sell it as a really cheap 
Um, but uh, very flavorful and then a flavor not everybody likes. It's not just pure sweet. Um, sweetener, it's a discount sweetener in, in history. Um, and how, how they can refine sugar now has been improved to the point that it's cheaper to make white sugar than to make molasses. In fact, it's cheaper to make white sugar today than to make brown sugar. The way they make brown sugar now, and why brown sugar is more expensive than white sugar, even though it's technically less refined, is they make all sugar into white sugar now, and they take the white sugar and pour some, brown, and some molasses on it to make it brown, and make brown sugar. <laughs> Honest to goodness. But historically, the more you refine sugar, the whiter it is, and the higher price it is, and the better pure sweetness it is. Um, the more impurities in it make the sugar darker, give it other flavors that are not usually desirable besides sweetness, and the stuff that just won't crystallize at all is a thick, tarry liquid called treacle or molasses. And that um, could be uh, used as a low quality, cheap sweetener, or it could be fermented and made into liquor. Now, this gets way too much into global politics, but the French also had a whole bunch of sugar islands, right? Haiti, especially. Um, and the French didn't want their molasses being made into rum. Why? It would compete with the French brandy. England didn't have a brandy industry, didn't have a wine industry back then. Um, and so they didn't care about what you did with the molasses. The French did. They made it illegal to make, to make um, rum in, in French Caribbean. But they had all this molasses, so they sold it really cheap to New England. New England bought it and made it into rum. Yeah. <laughs> so, like I said, you've got, you've got scores and scores and scores of these uh, uh, rum distillers, especially in and around Boston. Um, 1916 or something, one of the big five-story high tanks busted, and you had the great molasses flood that many of you heard of that, that killed a bunch of people and did millions of dollars of property damage. But that's early 20th century. Hmm? Yeah, you can still smell in some parts of Boston the, 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 rum, the, the molasses. Anyway, that's, that's New England rum. If you look at early account books, early record books, they usually agree that capital N, capital E, rum, any rum. Um, that's the cheap stuff. Um, if you wanted better rum, you could pay twice as much and get rum that was distilled in the Caribbean right there where they made the molasses, right there where they made the sugar. And they, if they made rum in the, in the Caribbean, it was a more expensive rum. It still is today. If you go to a liquor store, the Caribbean rum is more expensive than other rums. They make a rum in Kentucky. They make it everywhere now. Um, but anyway, the New England rum was the cheap stuff. It tended to be lighter in color, almost clear, didn't have much desirable flavor, um, and was potent was certainly very high in alcohol content, but it wasn't as high in alcohol content as the stuff from the Caribbean. The stuff from the Caribbean was higher in alcohol because they had to ship it farther. They didn't want us to pay money shipping water, so they distilled it to a higher proof, more alcohol in it, so it shipped cheaper. You know, what you're really trying to move, you're paying for, not the extra water. And um, the other reason that New England, that, excuse me, Caribbean rum, which was then at the time called West Indies rum. That's what they called the Caribbean. The East Indies is Indonesia, and the West Indies is the Caribbean. Um, so WI rum, West Indies rum, sold for about twice as much as Boston rum, New England rum. But the, the Caribbean rum was dark and higher in alcohol and higher in flavor. Because when they made it right there where they're making the molasses, they're making it in the same pots. So they don't bother to clean it out and filter it and put it in barrels as molasses. And so they called it the scummins. But all that stuff gives it more flavor, which is desirable if you like rums today, you know, most people like, like a Gosling Black Seal or a uh, Myers Planter Punch rum. Those are some good Caribbean rums now. Anyway, but beer, beer wasn't popular. The, I'm going out all afternoon about beer, but I don't want to do too much of beer. Beer, um, the English way of making beer is called top fermentation. The yeast that ferments the sugars from the, from the uh, grains floats on top. The problem is here in New England, we have a much broader swing of temperatures over the year than they do in Old England. And we also have a whole different crop 
of microorganisms floating around the air. These people didn't know for microorganisms, they just knew their beer, when they tried to make it here, didn't come out good, like it did in Old England. And so after a while, they said, let's just drink this cider, and they got away from making beer. Americans start drinking beer again in large quantities when a lot of German immigrants come in, especially in the mid and later 1800s, and German beer is made with a bottom fermentation where the yeast that does the work is protected from local flora, um, and, um, and, and the German technique of making beer also tends to make a lighter beer, the lagers and the pilsners, and that's what Americans tend to have a preference for until 20 years ago with all the craft beers and the IPAs and on and on and on. The, my point is, is we could go a whole different lecture on beer, but um, mostly these people around here 200 years ago were hard liquor drinkers for meals, they'd have cider. If they ran out of cider, mom could make what they, sh they, they would call, um, uh, the, what they called uh, uh, home beer. Um, it's a near beer. It's, it's basically, you take some molasses, some sugar, maybe some grain, throw it in a bucket, put some water, put the leftovers of making your bread for the yeast in, let it get a little fizzy, and give it to the kids for a couple days till it goes bad. And that's what you drink because you ran out of hard cider. So. Taverns are not big beer sellers, is my point. But anyway, oh, I should have gotten to this slide. But this is why rum, because, because New England's involved with the triangle trade. Um, um, I, 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 I've, been, I've never been good at the, wait a minute, we're gonna get to that in the next slide. I tend to like go on and tell you things while people ask. But anyways, um, because I think I explained most everything here, except the whole triangle trade that causes the kidnapping of millions of Africans to grow the sugar um, to, uh, to get Europeans rich and New Englanders rich because when they're growing sugar, I wish I could cover that, didn't I? But anyway, um, the point is, is that uh, New England was intimately involved in this trade with the Caribbean that got a lot of rum and a lot of molasses to make rum here from the Caribbean. And I talked about drinking apples already and how distilling the um, cider could make a brandy. You could also make um, cider um, into brandy um, by leaving barrels of hard cider out in cold winter nights because just as alcohol evaporates at a lower temperature than water, it freezes at a um, lower temperature than water. And so if you put a barrel of hard cider, which is 5% alcohol, 95% water out on a cold winter's night, and then you take the crystals and throw them away, you're throwing away mostly water, and the liquid is going to have a lot more alcohol in it. You'll never get it to complete alcohol doing it that way, but you get to concentrate the alcohol by freezing it as well. But distilling is preferred. <clears throat> so, whiskey is another question. Um, whiskey was a drink of the West and the South. Basically, when, pe when English speakers settled um, North America, um, different people from different parts of England tended to settle different parts of the country. About 20, 30 years ago, um, a brilliant professor from, I think Brandeis, uh, David Hackett Fisher, um, wrote a book called Albion Seed, where he in great detail analyzed how different people from different parts of England settle different parts of this country and make our different parts of the country very unique in how we name our kids and how we, um, uh, how we drink. Anyway, the point is, is that people from the north of England and from Scotland and Ireland tend to make whiskey. People who settled New England tend to be from the south of England where they're drinking gin. And so it's not in our cultural makeup. If I was an English descendant, which I'm not, but our tr traditional Yankees that come here, um, uh, most, most people in New England 200 years ago were the descendants of men and women who'd come from Old England mostly the south of Old England in the 1630s, it was called the Great Puritan Migration. Um, oh my gosh, now that screen is totally wiped out. <laughs> anyway, um, but anyway, um, the point is it's just not a drink that um, is culturally common here. I mean, you go, to, you go to European countries, they have their local drinks. I was in Romania, a lovely country in Eastern Europe a while ago. Their local liquor is called Soika. It's a double distilled plum brandy. But usually most Americans don't order a Zoika when they go out to a bar. 
Good luck getting them. Glasses like at most bars. Um, but anyhow, the point is, we, you drink what your culture gets into drinking. And just these people around here weren't whiskey drinkers. Knowingly, I had that little thing, and you can still read that, in Chief Disguise Drink of the Northeast. When I was doing research in um, a, a document called McLean's Report, 1832, Congress asked the Secretary of the Treasury, who at the time was a man named Louis B. McLean, to survey the entire country about our industrial output. And he noted in the small type of his survey of those distilleries in Boston, where they got their supplies, mostly it's molasses from the, from the West Indies. But every once in a while, they talk about whiskey. What are they doing with whiskey? The point is, by the 1800s, transportation has evolved enough, and farming in, the, in the, um, what they call the West, like Ohio, had evolved enough that they could, um, they could buy, basically it was unaged whiskey, what we call vodka today, neutral grain spirits, and um, for, for so little money that they would buy it, mix it in with the rum they made, and sell it. It was disguised to boost the alcohol content at a lower price. As long as New Englanders didn't know they were drinking whiskey, it was all good. So um, anyhow, um, I'll tell you one more boring story. I mentioned I was in Romania and they're drinking Zoika. When I was there, um, uh, when I was there, there were people staying at a hostel near where I was staying. Locals, um, well, people from the from elsewhere in Romania taking classes at the museum I was staying at, and they would bring greasy old reused Coke bottles full of their local, literally moonshine, um, Zoika. And they'd be very generous to share it. Well, I felt guilty, I didn't have anything to share with them, so I went down to the nearest city and found um, a little store. The store was a glass cube with a tiny window and all the stuff for sale. Thank you so much for closing the windows. Um, anyway, um, the, the little, little lady in the window and all the stuff was displayed in the glass cube. And you just point to what you want, Ashta, I want that. And she'd get it for you and kid Costa, how much? She'd tell you how much, she'd give her the money, she'd give it to you out the little window. Well, I wanted to get bourbon, because I like bourbon. I figure it's a classic American drink. They didn't have bourbon. Um, it turns out the only whiskey Romanians at the time got was scotch. They don't like scotch. I don't like scotch. It was good. I found rum. I figured, oh, good. That's an American drink. I like rum as well. You know, it's a New World drink. And they had one with a pirate on the label, you know, classic pirate on the label. And um, it said, Rum de Jamaica, which you can figure out was Romanian for Jamaican rum. And so I bought it. I was happy. It tasted worse than the, the double distilled battery acid that the locals drank. Um, and before I threw the, but they were polite, they drank it. And, um, and before I threw the bottle away, in really fine print on the back label in Romanian, I'll translate to English, it said ingredients, um, neutral grain spirits, artificial color, artificial flavor, made in Bucharest. So it wasn't rum at all. It was, it was basically vodka that was colored and flavored and uh, sold as rum, but it wasn't rum. Anyway, um, no, very little consumer protection. Of course, you did have the Whiskey Rebellion in Western Pennsylvania when um, just after the American Revolution, uh, some farmers said, wait a minute, didn't we just fight a war about taxes? How come they're trying to tax us? And George Washington, who was the first president, said, yeah, but now we're us taxing the, ourselves. You're going to pay the tax on whiskey. And so he got um, the local eastern militia from Pennsylvania together with Alexander Hamilton there behind him and marched out with a couple thousand troops and said, you're going to pay the taxes? They go, OK, fine, we'll pay. And, um, and America was, was saved. The first test of the Union was saved. And then as soon as Thomas Jefferson was president, he said, ah, let's not tax whiskey. But nonetheless, that's another story. So um, on, to, on to actual getting into drinking. Um, you don't have a whole vast array of drinks to choose from like we do in the 21st century. In fact, the very first bartender's guide doesn't get published till 1862 by a New York bartender named Jerry Thomas. And it's a fairly thin volume of that. It's not the old Mr. Boston. So, like I said, a lot of people just drank straight liquor, rum, gin, and um, brandy, mostly here in New England. But sometimes they'd water it down. If you take liquor and add water, it's called grog. That's what grog is. Ah, give me the grog. 
Again, the captains in, you know, on ocean voyages, they don't have the time and the storage space to store, to store um, beer, so they have to have concentrated liquor, but they want to not give the, the sailors a lot of liquor, so they mostly water it down. It makes the water a little more palatable, it makes the sailors a little less grumpy to have a little bit of alcohol in their, in their um, ration, but uh, that's what grog is, it's just watered down liquor. And so people would drink that. So, um, if you added sugar to grog, if you watered down liquor, you've got nim or nimbo. Um, so, a fairly simple thing. And I got three liquors, you know, rum, brandy, gin, add, add them to it, you could have rum grog, um, cider uh, brandy grog, or gin grog. Um, then you should use that very much as, you know, put water in it, call it a day. But anyway, if you need to call it something, that's what it's called. You add sugar to make it a little nicer. It's min. If you took one of these iron pokers here um, and put it in a fire, got it red hot and plunged it in, that would get your drink all foamy and fizzy and heat it up really quick. And because you're heating it up in a matter of seconds and in a very localized heat, because the red hot poker is like 1600 degrees, it's gonna heat everything in a couple seconds, much faster than a microwave. So fast that very little of the, of the liquor has a chance to boil off. So that's why I said don't put your pot of spiced rum on the stove for hours. Um, heat it real quick, like microwave or even better with a, um, with a toddy on it. Um, because that'll, that'll make it uh, nicer. So yeah, a little water, a little sugar, and then heat it up and you got a toddy. You've heard of hot toddies, you know. Um, they're nice on a cold day. And also those, those, those toddies are, those irons, those toddy irons, are also called mulling irons or they're called uh, pokers or loggerheads. Ever hear people, you know, they came to loggerheads? Yeah. You got a bunch of these iron sticks with a weight on the ends hanging around the bar room and guys that drink too much, they go, they pick up a weapon. That's, they're kind of fighting with them. They're called coming to loggerheads. <laughs> That's where that comes from. Anyway, if you don't add heat, but you take your spirits, your water, your sugar, and add some lemon juice to make it nice, um, you've got a sling. I think the only sling we drink, they drank a lot of sling. You look at old bars, um, uh, tavern receipts, you find people ordering slings a fair amount. Um, <coughs> nowadays, I guess the only sling that readily comes to my mind is the Singapore sling. Yeah. You ever heard of that? Yeah, it's, it's, got, it's made with, um, with a, a flavored liquor called slow gin, S-L-O-E, it's a berry. It's not slow gin, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's a gin flavored with, with slow berries. Um, and, and uh, but lemon um, it was invented actually at a place called Raffles Long Bar in uh, Singapore, which if you're in Singapore, really cool country, go to Raffles, have a couple drinks. You're not have the Singapore sling, but you may as well because it's what it was invented. If you mix the sling in a bowl and add spices and um, invite friends, then you have what's called punch. And I figure we've got friends here and you've been very patient, so I'm going to make a punch for you this afternoon. I brought um, some whiskey, because some people don't like rum. This is, uh, you'll notice it kind of looks like a log cabin. If you come up and look at it, it says E.G. Booze, B-O-Z-Z, -Z. Um, no E on the end. That's why we call liquor booze, because in 1840, a Philadelphia distiller named E.G. Booze started bottling his whiskey in little log cabin bottles. He called it old cabin whiskey which got sold by, the, the brand got sold a lot, but cabin whiskey got, got made into the mid-20th century. Old cabin whiskey. The reason the cat log cabin got popular and the reason E.G. Booze put the, the date of 1840, it's on the back, on his bottle, is because in the presidential election of 1840, the successful candidate, um, William Henry Harrison, campaigned on a, on a ticket of log cabins and hard cider the common drink of the common man, which he wasn't um, a common man. His father signed the Declaration of Independence. They were fairly rich. He grew up on a plantation in Virginia, but being rich doesn't get you elected president. Well, I can't say it anymore. Um, <laughs> but um, but it, it uh, doesn't do much for your popularity. So he campaigned on this thing. And hard, there was a whole bunch of hype about log cabins. And so booze capitalized on that by putting his whiskey in cabin-shaped bottles. And it stayed popular for um, over 100 years that way. Anyway, um, and I also brought some of the nice, the West Indies rum, the nice flavorful rum. 
Anybody really hate rum? Otherwise, I'll make a rum punch and it's where New Englanders here. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to make it a punch bowl. Now, in the 1700s, early 1800s, usually when you ordered punch, you ordered a bowl of it. And you'd pass it around with your friends and drink from the bowl. Yeah, I mean, me, I'm sure none of you have done this, but I'm sure you might have known people who would go to rock concerts and, and take a certain kind of cigarette that's now legal in Massachusetts and pass it around. Or you might have passed a bottle around in a bag. Or sometimes you go to a Chinese restaurant and order a scorpion bowl and we get their colored plastic straw. Right, it's the same idea. Punch as a convivial drink was on its way out by the early 1800s. It was still around, but it was less popular. But, um, or it would be popular, but then you got your individual glasses. I'm not going to pass the bowl around. One, lecture, one time I did this and they said, we don't care. Okay, here, take the bowl. <laughs> um, but I do have little, little cups, I'll make samples. But anyway, I often think the punch bowls have cute little sayings at the bottom. This one is, drink about, see it out, come be quicker, fill with more liquor. Um, and this one is, one more and then. So, we will make punch. So, um, having sanitized my hands, the uh, first thing we want is rum. So we're gonna use rum, right? Is rum okay or do you want whiskey punch? Good, good Yankees, we'll do rum. So. A little more. There we go. And in the progression of drinks, we take the, the rum, we make it into grog. Not too much water. Um, and then we add sugar. Now sugar, up until the early 20th century, came in loaves. That's why you have Sugarloaf Mountain. The way they made the sugar is they would take the boiled down sap from the, um, from the sugar cane, the big sweet grasses, and pour it into clay molds, right, with a little hole in the bottom that was plugged. And they let that, when they boiled it and boiled it and boiled it, until it was the right consistency there, and then as it cooled, it crystallized and it would solidify, except for that molasses, which would settle to the bottom. They pull the plug, bleep, the molasses drained out the bottom. The rest is a nice loaf of hard sugar that they'd wrap in blue paper because when you unwrapped it, the blue made the sugar look whiter, which is why laundry detergent often is colored blue to make it, your clothes get a little, by putting a tiny bit of blue in it makes your eyes think it's whiter. Anyhow, what they would do is they take sugar nippers, these specialized pincers, and nip off a bit of sugar and then pound it. They didn't have granulated sugar until the early 20th century. I don't want to spend all afternoon pounding sugar so and making you watch. So I've already pounded some sugar, so we'll add some sugar. That's enough, I think. Like it sweeter? No? Yes? Okay. We're good? Okay. We'll mix that. This is, this is a, um, a toddy stick. Um, it's like a little baseball bat. But it's for mixing. You're crushing your sugar, crushing other things, mixing your, your drinks here, just with a toddy stick. Okay, the uh, next thing we do to take um, the lovely, um, what do you call it? Um, we've got the mim, and then we've made it into um, uh, the sugar. We've got a mim going here, and now we'll add some lemon. Pick out the seed, put it in that bowl. I'm gonna do it like Rachel Ray says, you know? This way you get less seeds in your, in your concoction. I'm not going to add EVOO as Rachel always does. But, um, that would be gross. But we'll try to keep the, the lemons in and the seeds out. If we get a seed, you get a bonus. So you can have an extra cup. Anyway, I could squeeze more, but oh, that's probably enough lemon. Okay. Doctors know what's going on. <laughs> okay, so now we've got sugar and lemon. So now we have a sling. And to make it into a punch, we add spice. The spice I prefer to add um, is a nutmeg. Nutmeg's a little tropical um, nut that grows. The outer, the outer membrane of nutmeg. Oh, thank you. Oh, aren't you good? Thank you. Um, the, uh, the outer membrane of nutmeg is another spice called mace, which has a similar flavor. If you ever, you know, made pie and it says add some mace, it's just the outer membrane of the nutmeg. But I've got nutmeg, which is a hard little thing and a little grater, so I'm going to grate some. Whoops, don't drop the nutmeg in there, Tom. I'm grate some nutmeg. 
which when you freshly grate it has a nice sharper flavor than if you um you want some lights on? Uh, I can see what I'm doing. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Yep. Wonderful. Okie dokie. Thank you again for the napkin. Okay, and we'll mix in the mace. All right, not the mace. We'll mix in the um, nutmeg with the uh, the rum and the sugar and the lemon. And then we have a lot of punch. So I'm going to pour little cups of it here. And anybody who wants some can have some. Um, and you could add other things. As I dish this out, I'm going to advance the slide. Um, and punch was very popular, especially in the late 1700s. Um, they're saying here, punch is good, cures the gout. Of course, alcohol is bad. It, it, what alcohol does inhibits the diuretic hormone. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Lovely. Oh, good. We have, we have bar help. Um, uh, yeah, it inhibits the anti-diuretic hormone and actually depletes your um, uh, uh, water content and tends uric acid crystals to form your joints, which is what gout is. And the lady here, and it cures the colic. Of course, it interrupts digestion and, uh, and the physic. You know, it stimulates you. Of course, alcohol is a depressant, but you know, people believe what they want to believe. Um, but punch began to lose popularity in the late 1700s and early 1800s, especially, like I said, the communal bowl. But here is people passing around the bowl, and sometimes they get into the individual little cups. But at parties, you know, people like punch, and, and uh, it's still popular today, especially at holidays. Um, if you added bitters um, to, your, to your punch, then you had something called, a, and to put it individual glasses, then you had a cocktail. Um, bitters, they still sell. You know, if you make like an old fashioned or something like that, it always is add bitters. And um, bitters are specially fermented things, and everybody who makes bitters makes a big deal that it's a secret formula for their bitters. But, um, you know, things like fermented orange peel, um, it's kind of it's like the Worcestershire sauce of liquor is what bitters are. And um, I, I, I'll, I'll read you this quote since you might not be able to see it. Um, this is a balance from Columbian Repository published in Hudson, New York. This is May 13, 1806, where the he editor Harry Cosmo answered the question, what is a cocktail? We can find a cocktail of this. Cocktail is a stimulating liquor composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. It is vulgarly called a bitter sling and is supposed to be an excellent electioneering potion as it renders, as, as it, it renders the heart stout and bold at the same time it fuddles the head. It is said also to be of great use to a democratic candidate, small b, um, because a person having swallowed a glass of it is ready to swallow anything else. Um, and of course, there was a great tradition in early America of liquoring up the voters to get them to vote for new warriors candidates. Um, but anyway, so that's what makes a cocktail. When, when Jerry Thomas did um, publish that first Bartender's Guide in 1862, he included uh, 10 different recipes for cocktails. Every one of them had bitters. That's what distinguished a, a, a drink as a cocktail at the time was it contained bitters. Um, so there we go. Um, the whole idea of cocktail is all a bunch of nonsense lies online about why it's called a cocktail. That it's the cocktailings, the dregs of the barrel, that's not it. You know, it's, it's something about a bobtailed horse or the end of a horse. or They put a chicken feather in it to make it look fancy. Um, that's, that's what I call reverse etymology. People make up stories that sound good, but they aren't true, rather than figuring out what the word really came from. It probably came from um, a word that's pronounced in America, cocte, um, which was a, a cup. Um, and uh, um, Antoine Ademé Pichard, very good. There we are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your help. Thank you for serving. Um, anyway, um, that, uh, that he served brandy mixed with bitters and egg cups, which were called the cocktail, the potier, and uh, that's why it's called a cocktail. So, anyway, there's all sorts of fancy drinks, flip and syllabub and posset, that have uh, eggs and curdled, and curdled cream and more sugar, and they're whipped and they're fancy. And they, it's more like alcoholic desserts than, than you know, drinks that men had at bars. Um, they're, pop, they're popular, um, you know, for fancy desserts today. One, one thing that men did order at bars sometimes was called flip. 
Um, in the 1600s, flip was made with beer and liquor and sugar, and it was heated with one of those red hot pokers to make it flippy or frothy, um, hence the name. But by the 1800s, especially because it was hard to get um, beer in America, they added eggs, beaten eggs, um, and nutmeg instead of the beer, but still had the liquor, the rum, the, um, the, the, uh, the, the um, sugar, and they would pour it back and forth, back and forth from one glass to another to make it extra foamy, to get the egg whites whipped up. And that's what was called flip or flippy. Um, uh, sometimes I've made it for people, I usually use a little beer too, and people nowadays seem to like it better that way. But um, anyway, today there's some recipes you get in line that have cold, that have, that are made with cold cream in it, and they don't bother to make it frothy. That sounds like eggnog to me, but you know, <laughs> people call things what they will. Like I said, the syllabub and the posset was cream and sugar and wine and oranges. And also, it's a, it's, for as far as I'm concerned, it's a fancy dessert that has a little alcohol in it. It's not a drink, but anyhow, that was out there. Anyway, so bar rooms are places that people, um, came, that men mostly, went to drink. Um, this, there, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that Americans drank a lot more per capita than three times as much as Americans do today. And so one historian, W.C. Rohrbach, has called it the Alcoholic Republic. And you did have a backlash with the temperance movement, this idea to eliminate. This is the, uh, the drunkard's path. And it's hard to see, but on the, on the lower left, he's got a glass with a friend. And then he gets a little more social, a little more social, a little more social. And then it starts you know, becoming that he you know, has poverty and disease. And, He's abandoned by his friends and turns to crime and finally, you know, in an alcoholic despair, he blows his brains out. So these, these little, you know, the way you could go if you're not careful, things were very popular at the time. Um, who stayed at these taverns? Um, a lot of people. A lot of times, the money was the local men hanging out. There's no TVs, no sports bars um, at the time, but a lot of the local men hang out, hung out and drank um, and commiserated. Um, but you also had travelers, um, people traveling on business, peddlers, itinerant tradesmen. Um, in, in 1828, the Southbridge Courier newspaper um, had a correspondent who was in Oxford, Massachusetts, who mentioned in 10 days there were 28 peddlers came through the little town of Oxford in 10 days. Yeah, so there were, there were traveling salesmen everywhere. Other people were itinerant. Dentists were often itinerant coming through. Hawthorne described dentists. He met some preachers were itinerant would come through. Hawthorne described them. Artists would often come around. Actually, they called themselves painters. Painters would paint anything. It was like they'd paint your house, they'd paint a tavern sign, they'd paint a picture of your wife, you know, how much you paid them was how good the, the painting came out. Um, you know, honest, uh, they're, they're, they used to have this thing, go, oh, look how primitive this painting is. We found advertisements from painters um, like Henry Matthew or William Matthew Pryor that basically for five dollars you get a painting that looks like a girl for fifty dollars you get this beautiful thing with shade and shadow that looks like your wife you know and um, no seriously um, so it's more a matter of the skill of not so much the skill or lack of skill of an artist but how much the the uh, the, the patron wants to pay for the painting that they have so there are a lot of different um, people that are traveling there are also drovers people in the fall would go around to farms and buy up extra livestock and, and drive them on foot, on hoof, um, to, uh, to, to big city markets like Brighton outside of Boston, which is where all the uh, meat was butchered for the urban areas in Massachusetts a couple hundred years ago. But they had to stay somewhere at night, so they'd stay at taverns. Um, and like I said, local patrons. Um, this, this is a, a painting by a uh, Pennsylvania, well, German immigrant to Pennsylvania artist named uh, John Lewis Krimmel. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. But you see the, the bar room, and it's also a place where, uh, again, why the liquor is behind bars, and the fellows hanging out. And I love, you might not be able to see here, but this lady is looking at, the, at us, giving us a wink, saying, look what's going on. Don't tell mom I'm here. Um, and she goes to pet the dog, and the other folks dancing, and the old man hanging by the, the fire. He's probably a teamster, he's got a stationary driver, he's got a whip under his arm. Um, and the, the man playing fiddle to the can dance. All music was live then. This is another criminal painting. This is one of my favorite early 19th century paintings. 
because it's, a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, the, these paintings of, of other than just, you know, portraits were meant to tell a story. It's not like a photograph to uh, freeze a moment in time, but rather it's telling a story. And here you have the shoemaker who's um, just wearing slippers, scuffs, no socks. He's not wearing, you know, something around his neck like all the other men are doing, like I'm doing, like any decent man would do. He's not wearing a vest or a coat like any decent man would do. Um, but he's just there in his shirt sleeves, basically his underwear. He's got his hat on indoors, which a lot of the other men haven't done. Um, and here's his poor wife saying, Honey, come home and go back to work. Please, Daddy, I'm hungry and I'm shoeless, even though you're a shoemaker. And, you know, and he's going, Ah, leave me alone, I'm with my buds. And this guy's going, Oh, leave me out of it. This will be good, I'm going to watch. And the old man looking up from his newspaper to watch the show. Come on, have another. Oh, no, I better get home to the wife. And you got the, the peddler showing up. The door, this guy's yelling at the stagecoaches arrived. The guy roasting his feet by the stove is looking up to see what all the commotion's about. But it's another view of the of the bar room. And you see again the bar with the barkeeper there getting ready to make liquor for the stagecoach passengers that have arrived, keeping the liquor safely behind behind bars. Um, like I said, they all had a hall. I'm sorry. Well, the, the women aren't respectable in these cases. Um, this, this, is very, this is kind of almost on the frontier. You can see by the, the Conestoga wagon in the background, this is kind of showing life on the frontier. And like the frontier um, cabin hotel, the, uh, the rules of civilized society don't fully apply. So basically, bar rooms were not places for women, which is why the shoemaker's wife here is very much out of place. Because she's so desperate to get her, her um, lazy, drunken husband to come back to work and act respectably that she's, you know, lowered herself and her daughter to coming into the bar room um, to try to you know, get them to go out and go away. But usually bar rooms are not places for women unless they're serving drinks. Or better yet, I work at Old Sturbridge Village. I have been training new staff there for decades. And sometimes when I'm training staff, when, uh, my, my co-workers who are female will ask me about makeup. And I'll say, if I can see you're wearing makeup, you're wearing too much makeup. And I'll get arguments and oh, they had makeup back then. And I said, yes, and the prostitutes in Boston look lovely in it. We're not in Boston. So <laughs> right. don't, don't, if I can see you're wearing makeup, you're wearing too much makeup. So these, these young ladies here are, you know, come, they're on the country. The guy's smoking. That's something you wouldn't do when you're dancing with the ladies either. And that's, and that's why the fiddler has given us the look that the lady in the other painting was given. It's like, look what's going on here. This isn't going to go well. Yeah. So the women didn't drink at home? Ladies didn't drink at home, women drank at home. <laughs> Alcohol consumption was much higher for men. Certainly women drank and women um, would consume liquor. There's a diary kept in the 1830s by a Worcester um, lawyer, a single lawyer in Worcester named Christopher Columbus Baldwin. And it's a wonderful diary. It tells a lot about life in early Massachusetts um, in the 19th century. Um, he talks in one of his entries about a slaying party. One of the places they would go to halls like this, they would, in the winter, they would organize slaying parties. They'd rent slaves and they would invite ladies with invitations and they'd go on a sledding party. They'd go right around all bundled up in a sleigh. It was good because you could get the cuddle under the blanket and talk, but it was fun. You're driving around in the sleighs, bracing, and then they'd arrange, to, and these things were arranged. They'd arrange to stop at a tavern to warm up, take care of the horses for a while. And Baldwin notices how they'd ordered flip for the men, that you know, hard liquor with the, with the, um, the foamy stuff, and, um, and they had um, uh, mulled wine for the ladies. But there was a mix up, he said. By the time the men got in, the women had drank all their flip, and, uh, <laughs> and, and half the mulled wine, the guys didn't have much but a little bit of mulled wine. And the ladies said that even though they drank all the flip, that they didn't like it very much, but they still drank it. Um, so again, there's that idea of what ladies do and what women do. So I would say these two aren't ladies. Anyhow, um, and ga ga gaming went on. Now, if you were caught gambling at a tavern, the ta you could be fined, the tavern keeper could be heavily fined, eventually could lose his license. So um, legally, they couldn't gamble. The people, again, like the women in the bar room. Hmm. 
except for maybe the tavern's wife or the tavern keeper's daughter, you know, serving drinks, cleaning up. You don't really have ladies hanging around the bar room very much, but uh, it happened. And same thing with gambling. You know, it's illegal, but it went on. Um, cards, of course, and of course singing. As I mentioned with the fiddler, all music at the time was live. There's no recorded music, and, um, and so we've got, um, the gentleman would often, for, for a dance, pay a fiddler or two or three to, to have music for dancing, but often people would just sing together, as some people, you know, do today when they've had a few, you know, libations at Christmas time or other times. And uh, often the guys would sing songs that were a little bit um, off, off, off key. I'm not going to sing anything terribly. I can't sing very well. I'll probably more recite with a hint of lyric. Um, this is George Washington, by the way, his favorite drinking song. How do we know that? Um, his his uh, groom, uh, his, his enslaved man who took care of him who, when he got old and crippled, George Washington um, freed. A man named Billy Lee remembered it was, it was George Washington's favorite drinking song. It's called Here's the Maiden. It's actually from a, um, uh, a comic musical of the late 1700s, well, mid-1700s. Um, but here's to the maiden of bashful 15, here's to the widow of 50, here's to the flaunting extravagant queen, and here's to the housewife who's thrifty. Let the toast pass, drink to the last, I'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Let the toast pass, drink to the last, I'll warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. In other words, you know, uh, she's going to drive me to drink. And it goes on with this. Here's to the charmer whose dimples we prize, now to the maid who has none, sir. Here's to the girl with a pair of blue eyes, and here's to the nymph with but one, sir. Some poor girl who lost her eye. Um, here's, to, yeah, anyway, on and on. Here's to the maid with a bosom of snow. Here's, uh, here's the one that's as brown as a berry. Here's to the wife with a face full of woe. And now to the damsel that's merry. On and on and on. That's, um, that's one of the, that was George Washington's favorite. Here's to the maiden. Um, another one that's a little more off. This one actually got recorded in the 1950s. A lusty young smith. Um, uh, let's see. A lusty young smith that is, I'm not going to try to sing this one. A lusty young smith that his vice stood a filing, his hammer lay by, by his, but his forge still aglow. When to him a buxom young damsel came smiling and asked him to work at her forge, he would go. And I'm not going to sing the real lyrics, but the bolderized version with a jingle, bang, jingle, bang, jingle, bang, jingle, with a jingle, bang, jingle, bang, jingle, hi ho. Uh, I said to the smith, in the, uh, let's see, I. Uh, I will, said the smith, and they went off together, along to the young damsel's forge they did go. They stripped to go to it, t'was hot work and hot weather. She kindled a fire and soon made him glow, with a jingle baba. Her husband, she said, no good work could afford her, his strength and his tools were worn out long ago. And the smith said, well, mine are in very good order, and I am ready for my skill for to show. And this goes on and on, it gets worse and worse, and I'm starting to blush. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, so that's the kind of thing that, that people do. Um, that was tavern life in a nutshell.